Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Prime Minister, thank you very much for joining us. Um, just to set the scene, what we thought we'd do is um, break these discussions about Brexit into three broad groups. First, taking stock of where we are now, the next stage of the negotiations and preparations for no deal. And then we're going to move on to talk about some of the security and border issues. And then finally, to look at trade and the economy. And then we're going to take a break from Brexit and talk about Huawei. Um, so. Just starting with that, we're going to open with Hilary Benn. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Prime Minister. It's been reported that the government has cancelled the No Deal Brexit ferry mm -hmm. contracts. Is that the case? And if so, how much is it going to cost? Well, I can, if I can come on to the ferry contracts, I wondered if it would be helpful before I did that, if I sort of set the scene as you're interested in, the, in where we are on negotiations and what we're doing. And Very Prime briefly, Minister, well, because we have we have quite a lot of yeah. a lot of questions. I'm, I'm, I'm to get sure it may to. be that my setting the scene will answer some of those questions. Okay, <laughs> I think that's because I, I think if I update, obviously it's our policy to leave the EU in as orderly a fashion as soon as possible, and I regret the fact that it hasn't been possible. I've voted three times to do it, but it's obviously we haven't built a majority across the House, and obviously as everybody knows, the House has also rejected No Deal and other actions, including the People's Vote, and by the legislation that was passed uh, uh, in, in compelled us to seek an extension. And as you know, uh, I sought that extension until the 30th of June, but the council, after lengthy deliberations, gave that extension until the 31st of October, but it's terminable. So we can leave at any point up until that time, and we will leave at the end of the month in which Parliament ratifies the withdrawal agreement. I think this is important because I want that to happen before the October deadline. And I think that once a consensus is reached, members should look to pass the necessary legislation and end the uncertainty as soon as is practically possible. We've been making concerted efforts to build on that consensus, uh, cross-party discussions on workers' rights, for example, making it clear we'd accept the amendment tabled by Gareth Snell and Nisa Nandy on the role of Parliament, and um, obviously we tried to ask the House to ratify the withdrawal agreement itself, which the House chose not to do. But obviously then following that, the Cabinet agreed that the right thing for us to do was to reach out to the opposition um, in order to decide how we can build a majority for the ratification of the withdrawal agreement and leaving. Uh, and I think that was unprecedented, uh, but I'm convinced it was the right thing to do because public want to see us working together to deliver the result of the referendum. And we've been having constructive, meaningful talks which are continuing. There are differences on issues, uh, and, but on many of the key areas, particularly on the withdrawal agreement, there's common ground. And we know that we need to end this uncertainty and do it as soon as possible. Uh, and I hope that the deal can be done. We certainly approach this with an open mind. But if we're not able to do that, then we will bring um, votes to the House in order to determine what the House can support. And uh, we stand ready to abide by that decision if the opposition are willing to do so. Um, obviously, I'm sure there'll be lots of technical uh, questions, but I think the choice before the House remains the choice that has always been before the House in relation to this issue, which is we can form a majority to ratify and leave with a deal. We can decide to leave with no deal. We can go back to the people, admit failure, and ask them to think again, or we could revoke Brexit. Those are the choices. I think the one that's the only acceptable is to form a majority to ratify the withdrawal agreement. Meanwhile, and, and I will continue to work and do everything I can to enable us to do that because I think that's what's right in the national interest. What we do meanwhile of course is continue our preparations. Part of the issues around the preparations for no deal which uh, I've just been asked about in relation to the ferry contracts. Those ferry contracts uh, because in the light of the extension that I've just referenced we're reviewing the contingency planning that's taken place in relation to no deal. We've decided to terminate the contracts with Brittany Ferries and DFDS. <coughs> Those contracts were a vital contingency measure, ensuring that critical goods like medicines could enter the UK in the event of disruption along the short straits in a no-deal scenario. Um, but they both included early termination fees to ensure that we would not have to pay the full contract cost in the event that the capacity was no longer needed. How much would it cost? To cancel the contracts. It will cost uh, less than it would to carry on running the uh, running well, the contract. Mayor estimated it would be, I think, around 56 million quid. Could you confirm that figure? I would write to the uh, uh, committee with with figures. But I, I think, but I think if you're if we're talking about 
the um, question of costs, the point I've just made is an important one, which is that the combined termination costs with the operators is substantially lower than the national, uh, it is actually lower than the NAO's recent estimate of termination costs, um, uh, thanks to the, the decisions we took, but it's also lower than keeping those contracts on. I'm sure everybody would agree that we have to take the decision that is best in terms of the use of taxpayers' money. I understand money. that entirely, but does that mean that the it, the government has now accepted that there won't be a no-deal Brexit. In other words, if you have accepted that, you, I can see why you cancel the contracts and won't need them anymore, or might you have to stand them up again if we come to the 31st of October without an agreement? What is the government's policy now on a no-deal Brexit? The government's policy is that we want to leave the European Union with a deal, and that is what we continue to work for. Uh, but, of course, it is not entirely in the hands of the government as to what happens there. First of all, Parliament has to ratify an agreement that enables us to leave with a deal, and so far Parliament has not been willing to do that, although Parliament has also not been willing to accept no deal. Um, and, but the extension and decision at the end of that, were we to get to that 31st of October date, without a deal ratified, and therefore without us having left the European Union, I sincerely hope we don't come to that position, um, it would not simply be a decision for the government as to what happened, because obviously at that point, uh, were there to be a request for a further extension, that would be in the hands of the 27 uh, uh, would. members of the European Union as well. Now, you referred to uh, the talks with the opposition. If they can't reach agreement, as you've just said, you're going to put a number of options to the House. Will that include an option for a customs union? We, what we would intend to do would be to discuss with the opposition because we would want this to be a process with which we, which we had discussed with the official opposition and which they were willing to support. Uh, we would discuss with them the options that would be put before the House. Include a customs union? We would discuss the options that well, would be put the before the Well, since the opposition is arguing for a customs union, one would have thought that they'd be very happy to see that put to the vote. Well, would it include a customs union? One of the discussions that we have been having, and I've, made this, uh, I've uh, said this uh, sort of thing publicly as well, is the whole question about customs arrangements for the future. Various terms are used in relation to customs. Sometimes people use different terms to mean the same thing. Sometimes it's uh, uh, meaning different, uh, different approaches. But what I think would be important when we come to that process is that anything that is put before the House, and obviously customs unions have been put before the House previously and been rejected by the House, anything that I would hope that we'd be able to get agreement with the opposition so there's a process that everybody can stand behind. Could it include a second referendum, a confirmatory referendum? One of those well, that's a, that's a question of a different order, isn't it? That's not a question of the a substance of the deal that would be uh, required in order to ratify the withdrawal agreement. That's about process in relation to uh, to an issue. And uh, as we uh, as we know, there are differences of opinion in relation to uh, a second referendum, and neither we, uh, as uh, the party in government, nor the official opposition, have uh, a policy of uh, second <coughs> referendum in all. In all circumstances. Johnson says it's a perfectly coherent proposition. Do you agree with him? It's a proposition that has been put by a number of members of the House inside this House and uh, elsewhere. That they coherent th proposition. Uh, my view about yeah. a second referendum is okay. that we should get on with delivering the first referendum. Uh, and that's what people want us to do. That's what people expect us to do. It is what the government at the time of the referendum said we would do. Okay. Can I turn, um, secondly, to the... UK's plans and negotiating objections, uh, objectives for phase two if a deal is agreed. Can you just confirm who will lead those negotiations for the UK side? Will, will it be the Secretary of State for accessing the European Union? That is, I think we, we would have a different arrangement for the negotiations. I think it most likely it would be led by the Secretary of State for exiting the European okay. Union. But, but if I can just explain, obviously the next stage of negotiations, phase two of negotiations, includes a wide range of issues and of course it would be necessary to be able to draw a cross expertise from across government on all of the matters that were involved. For example, one element of it is going to be security aspects. So obviously making sure that those who are uh, expert and well versed in those are part of those negotiations is going to be important. And what would be your role, or the, the role of your successor, if that's what happens, in the negotiations? How would that be handled with the Secretary of State? Well, the, 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 would be, the Secretary of State would, of course, operate according to policy that is set by the government. Um, so there would be not just a, a role for that individual and a role for the Prime Minister, but, of course, a role for the Cabinet. 
Is the government ready for the negotiations? I, I ask because the Secretary of State announced about a month ago the government was planning to set up an expert advisory group of technical experts in trade and customs. Has that group been established? There are various, uh, various pieces of work that are being done. Some of the announcements have been made have been in relation to work that we will do on looking, for example, at alternative arrangements to the backstop in the withdrawal agreement. Um, we would be wanting to extend the uh, input that we had on these matters uh, in the second phase of negotiations, and that's why we've referenced not just experts on issues like trade and customs, but also um, a greater interaction with business generally, with trade unions and with civil society. Have any of them been established yet? Well, Because it took the government a year and a half to decide what to ask for in the negotiations, and what I'm trying to establish is whether in fact the government is ready for phase two negotiations if we get to that point. And so the question I'm asking is, You've announced you want to set up a, a group of technical experts in trade and customs. Has it been established yet? The, uh, what you will have seen is actually it didn't take the government a year and a half to decide what it was going to ask for in the negotiations. I set out the outline of what the government was going to ask for in the Lancaster House speech, which was in early 2017. Um, we then obviously uh, fleshed that out in the letter triggering Article 50. Uh, we then went through, obviously we had the uh, discussions focusing initially on the withdrawal agreement aspect of the of the uh, arrangements with the European Union, but as you look at the political declaration, you will see a great deal in there, which has been, uh, from the uh, government's point of view, a lot of it hard fought in order to ensure that we can have a situation going into the second phase of negotiations that meets the requirements for the United Kingdom. As we go, as we go forward, uh, at, at the moment, obviously the whole question of what those objectives should be, and we've seen, as I said, the amendment that Gareth Snell and Lisa Nandy put down about Parliament having a greater role in that. That whole issue is one that is for uh, further discussion. Are you concerned, finally, that time is being lost because with each month of extension of Article 50, that is a month off the transition period? Well, I would have far preferred us... I know that. Yes, I would have far preferred us to leave on the 29th of March. Indeed, if, time to if, do all this if everyone now. across the House of Commons had voted the way I did, we would already no longer be member of the European Union. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to come on now to the civil service and no-deal preparation and Sir Bernard Jenkins. Well, I mean, um, Prime Minister, good afternoon. Um, the question is whether the civil service is still preparing for... Um, leaving without a deal, and you've um, you've confirmed that um, that's still the default legal position. But what exactly is the policy of the government? Because um, uh, as a matter of fact, an international law, the moment at which uh, the 29th of March deadline for the Article 50 period was extended was when you accepted the extension offered to you at that European Council on the 21st of March. That's correct, isn't it? Sorry, the, the, the first extension was obviously... First extension. Yes. It was at, you were at the Council, you accepted the extension. That is when Article 50 was extended. Yes. Yes. And, the, um, <clears throat> and it was not when Parliament subsequently passed the SI changing the exit date. That was just an implementation. The, the, the change of the SI exit date was necessary to ensure that UK domestic law was in line with the international law. Um, so, um, in the government's response to my committee's inquiry into the status of resolutions of the House of Commons, the government said that even for motions of return, humble addresses, such motions would, and I quote, this is the government's response, lack statutory force and a mere motion cannot be, quote, be used to change the law, compel the government to legislate or lay a regulation or tell ministers how to perform a statutory function. Um, so, whatever the political pressures may have been on you on the 29th of March, you were under no legally binding obligation of any kind to accept the extension, were you? Well, the government took a decision that it was right to and appropriate at that time to accept that extension. That was, as you know, a limited. That was, as you know, a limited extension, and that was done uh, in with the expectation or the uh, intent of trying to ensure that in that further space of time we were able to ensure that we could leave with the deal. Because, as I indicated earlier, it remains the government's position that the best option for the United Kingdom in our national interest is to leave with a deal. And at the subsequent um, summit, 
you made the same choice without any legal obligation upon you to do so. No, there was a legal obligation. There was an obligation at the, sec at the second summit because the House of Commons had passed a legislation that required government to ask for an extension. It required the government to seek an extension, but it didn't require you to accept any terms that were offered, and that's what you did. I accept that there was a significant discussion of, among the EU Council. I did accept the terms that were offered. There were a uh, crucial element that we uh, uh, insisted on or made clear that we wanted to see in that was the terminability of any period of time, should it go beyond the period of extension that we had asked for. But I think that the fact that the House of Commons had actually not just uh, in our, you know, your first question referenced a motion of the House of Commons. This wasn't just a motion of the House of Commons. It was an act of Parliament that was passed, exactly. requiring the government to, set, to seek an extension and setting certain parameters for that extension. But you, you, you were obliged to seek an extension, but actually you, you weren't obliged to accept an extension. Well, I think if one's obliged to seek an extension, the expectation is that one is going to accept an extension. No. There's no point asking for an extension and then saying... No. So, I mean, but, the, but let me explain that, because the implication of your question is this. We said we were going to ask for an extension to the 30th of June. The House had confirmed that. Uh, if I'd asked for an extension to the 30th of June and the European Council had come back with an extension to the 30th of June, the implication of your question is I should have said, no, sorry, I know we asked for that, but we don't want it any longer. I don't think that's quite how one behaves um, in international... Um, I think you'll find, Prime Minister, if you take advice from the Attorney-General, you weren't actually under an obligation to accept any extension. You were under an obligation to seek to be offered an extension, not to accept it. But the point is this, that um, under what conditions are you, would you be prepared to set aside the pressures you're under in order to deliver the referendum result and exercise your legal right to refuse an offer of a further extension? under Article 50, and if necessary, to leave without a deal. Well, I want us to leave the European Union. I have been working for us to leave the European Union. I have voted consistently in Parliament for us to leave the European Union. Had everybody in Parliament voted in the same way, we would no longer be a member of the European Union. This means, um, uh, I take that to mean that um, you're not going to contemplate leaving the European Union of your own choice without a, withdra without a withdrawal agreement. I'm making a very simple point, which is that... I'm it is, yes, I know, I'm, and I'm, I'm answering the question the way in which I choose to answer it. Uh, the, 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 point is, the point is very simple. I remain, I stand by the references I've made in the past that no deal is better than a bad deal. But I actually happen to think that we have a good deal. When I first made that reference, we, I was talking in the abstract, it was in Lancaster House. Um, we now are no longer talking in the abstract, we're talking against the background of a negotiated deal, hard fought, uh, which, has, which I believe is, the right, is a good deal for the United Kingdom. That's why I say, you know, and it remains the government's position that we will continue to work to leave with a deal. So if the House of Commons declines to approve the withdrawal agreement and declines to approve leaving without a deal, your choice will be remain in the European Union indefinitely. No, my choice, I do not believe we should be remaining in the European Union indefinitely. I believe that the, that is why I want to see the House of Commons agreeing. Contemplate choosing to leave I, without a deal. We'll stay in, won't we? Uh, we will only stay in if uh, Article 50 is revoked. I have been clear that I believe that it is the best option for the United Kingdom is to leave with a deal. That's what we are continuing to work for. Okay, well, one final question. Why haven't you helped the House of Commons already by publishing the Withdrawal Agreement Bill? Uh, we, are, we will publish the Withdrawal Agreement Bill when we have completed the work that we're doing on the Withdrawal Agreement Bill. The Withdrawal Agreement itself is not going to change. What's going to change in the Bill? The Withdrawal Agreement's been the same. Uh, since you agreed it at the end of last year? Well, we've already seen a number of things that have changed uh, that need to be reflected in the Withdrawal Agreement Bill uh, from the Withdrawal Agreement that was signed in November. There are the issues that have been f uh, agreed, further issues, legally binding issues that have been agreed with the European Union, and there are commitments that the government has given, for example, I've already referenced one, in relation to the amendment from Gareth Snell and Lisa Nandy. Uh, there are also commitments that we've uh, that we've given in uh, I've given and others have given in the House of Commons in relation to workers' rights. So it is not the case 
um, the, the withdrawal agreement bill that will be presented to Parliament today uh, will be the same. There's been changes, including in our negotiations with but the European Union. It's not unusual for the government to publish draft bills and then produce um, a final, introduce a bill that's different or amended, or indeed to introduce amendments during the passage of the bill. Wouldn't it help the House of Commons a very great deal for you to publish the withdrawal agreement bill now? Oh, I, I think it would be helpful for the House of Commons to pub, for us to publish the withdrawal agreement bill when we do so having considered all the issues that have changed since the withdrawal agreement in uh, November of last year uh, and when we are, com you know, we are able to enable the House to have proper consideration of that bill. And continuing the theme of legislative provisions, coming on to Sir William Cash. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, you just said, I want to leave the EU, Prime Minister. Well, why don't you get on with it and bring in the commencement order for a start? I mean, that wouldn't be a bad way to begin. But why do you claim that you carried out the referendum vote in leaving the EU and our manifesto when the withdrawal agreement legally requires United Kingdom citizens, businesses and workers to obey laws made by majority vote of the other 27 member states going on for years without our involvement, gives the UK courts the right to override United Kingdom Acts of Parliament, undermines the constitutional status of Northern Ireland, and thereby undermines our national interest. Why do you repeatedly and again today say that what you're doing in the withdrawal agreement is in our national interest? It most obviously is not. Well, uh, you said uh, at the beginning of your question that uh, I'd said, as I have just have, that I want us to leave the European Union, and you thought I should get on with it. Um, I've been trying to get on with it. I voted three times now uh, for the withdrawal agreement that will enable us to ratify that such one. that we can you, ca such that we can leave the European Union. Well, this is, you know, as I, and I repeat, that had the first meaningful vote gone through, then we could have got the legislation through and be out already. Um, the, uh, but I do not accept the description that you have given of the position that the United Kingdom will be in uh, following the, on the basis of the withdrawal agreement and the future, uh, proposed future relationship that we're negotiating, will negotiate in phase two with the European Union. Uh, and uh, well, I could go through the specific issues if you like, but it is not the case. It is very clear that it is not the case that we are going to see um, the continued remit of the European Court of Justice here in the United Kingdom. Well, Prime Minister, when I called on you to resign the other day in the House, you said that the withdrawal agreement was a good deal for the United Kingdom. But how can it be so when it deliberately undermines the repeal of the European Communities Act 1972? And I've mentioned already there's no commencement order. This shackles us to all EU... Just a minute, if I may, please. This shackles us to all EU treaties and laws your 108 promises not to extend the time have been overridden by what many regard as an unlawful statutory instrument, which is now before this Joint Committee on Statutory Instruments. You gave instructions to Conservative MPs to defeat my amendment in the cooper Letwin bill, which would have stopped our taking part in the European elections. So we passed the European Union Withdrawal Act, and you know perfectly well, and we agree about this, if nothing else, that I put an enormous amount of time and effort, as we all did, in getting that Withdrawal Act through on the 26th of June 2018. So that would have taken us out of the EU, not this withdrawal agreement. And furthermore, why have you gone back on the repeal of the 1972 Act? Oh. First of all, I would hope that we would also now agree on both wanting to leave the European Union and wanting to ensure that in we can bring that way. in um, the proper way. Well, and wanting to ensure that we can bring that about. Um, uh, we've had the exchange about the 1972 Act on the floor of the House. Um, it is, of course, the European withdrawal, uh, the, the Act that has already been passed, does repeal the European uh, that 1972 Act and does that at the point of it. But, but, but. Uh, what we have negotiated within the withdrawal agreement is that implementation period or transition period as it's referred to in the uh, documentation for a period of time up to the end of December 20, uh, 2020 and during that period of time yes we will be continuing to operate um, uh, very much as we do today we wouldn't be a member but we would no. be continuing to operate as we do today and it would be necessary to reintroduce certain elements we won't be there, Prime Minister. We will have laws passed upon us by 27 other member states without our involvement, taken behind closed doors without even a transcript. That is not anything less 
than castrating the, the United Kingdom Parliament. And that is, uh, first of all, it is, if you look at the uh, timetables that are taking place in relation to directives from the European Union, actually, uh, I think with your experience in the European Scrutiny Committee, I'm sure you know that it isn't the case that you suddenly get a lot of laws passed by the European Union within the period of what would effectively be 12 months. Accelerated just procedures, accelerated um, procedures, there, there is, trilogues. But, but, but secondly, what we're talking about is the implementation period. We are not talking about the future relationship with the European Union. We're talking about a transition period that enables people to be able to have a smooth and orderly exit at the point at which we leave, that gives businesses an absolute certainty about the basis on which they will be operating at that point in time, and gives them and gives them the time to prepare for the gives them the time to prepare for the future relationship that, that would obviously be negotiated during that period of time. Interviewable. Interviewable now. We know. We know. We know. We know. Who knew? Right. Who else? Sir Patrick. <laughs> but, Prime Minister, the European Statutory Instruments Committee has recommended on 61 occasions that uh, the government reverse its original proposals to go from a, a negative procedure to an affirmative procedure. Uh, the government have accepted all of them, and I'm grateful for that uh, cooperation. And I think it shows <coughs> that uh, when a committee of the House has said that it wants something to be changed. The government have been willing to uh, change it. In, in your view now, as far as you are concerned, following the cooper Letwin bill, is it your view that it is impossible for us to leave without a deal? Um, I, what I think is that Parliament will act to make it... Uh, to insist that the UK government is not willing to leave without a deal. As I said, actually, leaving without a deal is not entirely in the hands of the UK government, because the issue of extensions to Article 50 rests with the whole of the European uh, Union um, and sitting around, that, uh, sitting around that table. But in that, the fact that the bill, the bill that was passed, uh, I did not support, but the bill was passed, uh, actually says that the deal has to be done. Your view as Prime Minister is that we have to, you have to as Prime Minister and any future Prime Minister would have to ensure a deal uh, to satisfy the House of Commons. The, the House of Commons has expressed its view. Um, as it happens, the view that the House of Commons has expressed that it wants to leave with a deal is the same view that the government has in terms of our policy. We believe that leaving with a deal is the best uh, Actually, this deal is the best route for the United Kingdom. Yes, I'll take the point because you did, you have said in the past that uh, you know leaving with uh, no de deal is better than leaving with a bad deal. You believe that the deal you've negotiated and come to agreement with after uh, two years of uh, hard negotiations is a deal that is in the best interests of the United Kingdom as a whole, and and that is something which has been followed through by a lot of business leaders and industry as well. Uh, I would press you to reconsider. Uh, the uh, publication of the Withdrawal Agreement Bill, because uh, it isn't uncommon uh, for governments to make lots of amendments during the passage of the bill. So I think the fact that one could make uh, and then will need to be amendments is not really a good reason not to publish it. So I, I think I'd ask you to reflect on whether actually to help Parliament, because uh, the frustration that is felt <coughs> not only across the House of Commons, but I also think across the country is just exactly where we're going and what is the direction of travel. Uh, and that is something which is causing a, a lot of concern um, from people I speak to, uh, be they business leaders or be they individuals. So I think uh, one of the things I'd ask you to consider um, fairly quickly, hopefully we're going to know the outcome of the cross-party talks soon. Uh, they do seem to have been going on almost as long as the uh, original discussions, but uh, I realise that's a, a slight exaggeration, but uh, hopefully we're going to know those in the next week or so. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. We need to move on now to Stephen McCartland. Thank you. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. Uh, Prime Minister, you mentioned workers' rights in your earlier statements. Um, the government's published some draft clauses around workers' rights. Do you think they go far enough in terms of protecting and enhancing workers' rights? Well, I think it's, it is important that we... Um, have within our legislation the, the commitment that we've given within the Withdrawal Act, about, uh, withdrawal agreement about non-regression in terms of workers' rights. Um, as um, as you will know, actually this government and this country has 
uh, workers in many areas has workers' rights that are above those that are provided by the European Union legislation. Um, obviously, the issue of workers' rights is one of those that has been uh, raised with us by members across the House, but particularly raised by the official opposition. And it's one of the issues that we will look at to see whether, uh, uh, how we can ensure that commitments that have been given by the government on workers' rights can be, uh, can be um, enshrined and, and clear for the future. I, mean, I think we can go much further now, and there are simple ways of tightening it up. So if you look at Section 1 of the draft clauses, it only applies to relevant bills, while Section 2 is vague on exactly which areas of legislation. So who would decide what's relevant, Parliament or the government? This is, uh, well, the, the, one of the um, issues that we're trying to ensure is that there is... Um, sufficient capability and ability for Parliament to be able to look at these to be able to look at these issues um, and the, uh, uh, the the question that when there is any change in the European Union um, government making obviously a, a, a statement as to whether or not we believe that is an enhancement or not and Parliament then having the opportunity to give its opinion on that I think is is an important but it's getting that balance between government and Parliament right that obviously will be one of the issues that will be debated when we do come to the Withdrawal Agreement Bill. So, <coughs> building on that, my understanding of the draft clauses are that it only commits the government to make a statement on new bills, but it does not say it has to make a statement on whether or not it removes any workers' rights or any other protections, so it's still quite wishy-washy. Um, I think the... the uh in, the intent is that uh, government should be would be able would be making clear to Parliament whether it, in its view, any decisions that have been taken in the European Union in relation to workers' rights were an enhancement of workers' rights, or um, you know what the the interaction with the UK legislation was in relation to this. But I'm happy to look at the specific point that you've raised about the language within that within the clause. Thank you. And then finally for me, I think that you know, no Parliament's able to bind its successors and as the proposals are currently formatted, it does look as though there's not any actual legal protections, it's just consultations and reports. So I'm just concerned that we can go much further if we tighten up the language. Well, I mean, we, we're certainly looking at what uh, it would be appropriate to in, put in legislation on this, uh, on this issue. So once again, I'm happy to take those points. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Can we move on now to security and border issues and, and Brexit, and starting with Yvette Cooper? Thank you, Prime Minister. Can I um, take you back to the issues around border checks, which um, discussed before, especially in the light of some of your earlier answers about wanting to get an agreement on the way forward, and also particularly talked about the potential for there being some um, common ground around customs. Are you still ruling out being part of a common external tariff? The, uh, as you know, the proposals that government put forward were proposals that would enable us to have as frictionless trade as possible with the European Union while being able to have our independent trade policy. That uh, uh, independent trade policy is within the political declaration. I believe that's very important. Part of that, obviously, there are different elements to an independent trade policy. Part of those are around issues like services. Um, but we're very clear that you know, if you're going to have trade agreements on goods, obviously the ability to vary tariffs in relation to that is, uh, is an important part of that. So does that mean you're saying you're still ruling out being in a single, being in the common external tariff for goods? The, well, as you know, there are certain elements within the, with, within the uh, operations within the implementation period. There are certain references in the backstop to this issue. What I'm saying is that what the proposals that government actually put forward would enable us to, uh, that we put forward over um, uh, uh, last uh, summer would enable us to ensure that we could operate a common external tariff for goods for the European Union, but also be able to vary tariffs for uh, our own trade agreements with other parts of the world. So are you relying then, you're going back to Chequers and to the customs partnership in Chequers, where effectively we collect the EU's tariffs, but they don't collect hours and there's no way of collecting tariffs for if we have differential tariffs for the goods that arrive to get here through Spain or Italy. As I'm sure you're aware, in the political declaration, 
Uh, this is not something that has been, uh, th this element has not been agreed. The, research, the benefits of a customs union are in the political declaration in terms of uh, uh, the uh, references to tariffs between us and quotas and so forth. Um, but this wider question is one which is referenced with um, reference to the spectrum of ac actions that there are. Government has put, for, put forward a proposal that addresses this issue. There are negotiations to be had in relation to what we, uh, to what, where we want to, uh, uh, obviously where we end up with the European Union. That's phase two of the negotiations. Um, but the political declaration recognises the importance of an independent trade policy. But this sounds like you're actually not shifting at all then around customs, because it sounds like you're still stuck on that same Chequers Customs Partnership that nobody from any side could see how it was workable <coughs> in any way. Now, you know, you're the one that's talked about compromise, and I'm just sort of trying to see, basically, has nothing changed? Are we still stuck? We are. We, we mm. are if, you're talk, if you're referencing the talks we're having with the official opposition, we are sitting down and talking with the official opposition about what both sides want to achieve in relation to, cust in relation to customs. Obviously, issues around friction of, of trade at the border are not just about customs, they're about regulatory uh, 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 issues as well. We're sitting down and talking about what is it that we both want to achieve in relation to these issues. I think, actually, um, there is uh, a greater commonality in terms of some of the benefits of a customs union that we've already identified between ourselves and the official opposition. We have, uh, the political declaration makes clear about an, an, an independent trade policy. Actually, looking at the balance of these issues is uh, part of the discussion. Can we come to an agreement on that? I hope we will be able to, but those discussions still continue. But there's only three ways that have been put forward as ways of trying to achieve the benefits of a customs union. One is the customs partnership that you talked about as part of Chequers that everybody says is completely unworkable because the EU will not collect our tariffs. Second is technology and the Home Office policy document has said the challenges of this work cannot be underestimated. Current realisation in the UK is 2030. And the third is being part of a single customs territory, effectively being part of the common external tariff. So that's why I'm just still trying to get this clear. If there is really some potential for agreement on uh, customs and getting the benefits of a customs union, then what is it that you're going to do? If you're still ruling out the common external tariff, you're still ruling out a customs union, and the technology isn't going to arrive until 2030, and the customs partnership just doesn't exist, it falls apart. Uh, well, first of all, uh, obviously we are sitting down with the official opposition and discussing those matters with the official opposition. The, uh, but the, I don't accept completely the picture that you have set out. I, recognize, I know the uh, reference you've made to technology, but an awful lot of work has been done on technology that, uh, that is available at the borders. Uh, and the opportunity that the UK has, actually, I think there's an opportunity for the UK to be introducing ways of dealing with these issues at our borders that could be world leading. Uh, uh, and I think it, uh, one of the problems with this debate has consistently been um, that very often it is framed in terms of existing models. And it is important for us to be looking at the new models that are available and that can be used in these areas. But it's also all too often framed in terms of existing language which people take to mean certain things. Now, there's a legal definition in, in WTO of what a customs union is, um, for example, but often people will use the term customs union and have in their mind different things about uh, what, that, uh, what that achieves, <coughs> which is why I say the important element of this is to actually be able to sit down and talk through what is it that we are all trying to achieve so here. Customs union, key elements of a customs union, common commercial policy and the common external tariff. So it sounds to me you are still absolutely ruling out being part of the common external tariff. Am I wrong? If you look at the uh, GATT 24, I think it's 24 8, uh, uh, it actually, 8A, it actually has different elements of a customs union. Okay, common external tariff. That's all I'm asking about. Common external tariff, in or out? You're, you're asking me about common external tariff, and what I'm saying is that we have, we have set out, the government has set out uh, in the discussions with the European Union, the uh, 
uh, on the political declaration, the spectrum of, uh, of, uh, that is available in relation to these matters, um, that is for the further negotiation. This is one of the issues that has been raised in the discussions with the official opposition, and obviously uh, there will be a point at which uh, we will have determined whether it's possible to have a landing zone, uh, a landing zone between us or not, in which case we move to the process I was asked about earlier, which is for the House to come to these decisions. But it sounds like we're still stuck basically where we were almost a year ago and it sounds like actually you're not really thinking any differently at all you did talk about compromises but it sounds like your version of compromise just means telling everybody else that you were right all along no. what's the evidence that you're actually going to shift position i mean look resilience is a strength, but stubbornness is a weakness. What is the evidence that you are actually on something as important as customs to manufacturing across the country, that you are actually prepared to properly make some changes? Well, you ask what the evidence is on compromise. There are a number of areas on which we have shown our willingness to compromise in uh, matters relating to the withdrawal agreement. So, uh, the question, but not on this one. Uh, well, first of all, you accused me of not being willing to compromise. I've pointed out that we have shown our willingness to compromise. On this particular issue of customs, uh, what is important is that we are able to sit down and, if you like, tease out what the different elements of this is. It isn't sufficient simply to say there's one thing and that's, that's it and that's not. Actually, there are different ways that we, we can approach this issue. We have been, we've already as a government been exploring those. Um, we have, and we haven't come to an agreement with the European Union. You're right on that point. The political declaration identifies a spectrum of opinion. We are sitting down and talking through with the official opposition what are the different elements of this and what is it we are trying to achieve. I think we both want to ensure what we have as we, you know, we, I and my colleagues stood on our manifesto on a deep and close partnership with the European Union for the future. That's what we are aiming to achieve. We feel like we're going round in circles mm -hmm. and everybody's feeling paralysed at the moment and like nothing is changing. When we've got something that is as important as the impact on manufacturing and, and so on, that you know has been such a source of disagreement between people in Parliament, I guess I'll just ask you a, a final time, are you ruling out any change to the government's position on customs? What and what, with due respect, I'm trying to point out is that we are having discussions with the official opposition on a range of issues. I think it is important on all of those issues that we identify what it is that we are all trying to achieve. I think actually we are trying to achieve in this area something very similar, which is ensuring that we protect jobs. Uh, and we want to protect jobs. Government has negotiated, and it was hard fought in the political declaration, but we negotiated a willingness to accept that uh, we should come together to see, uh, uh, to aim for as frictionless trade as possible between the UK and the European Union. How we achieve that has not been absolutely identified. So, first of all, we need to see what is it that will be agreed here in Parliament. Parliament has had an opportunity to vote for various things, uh, including a customs union. It has not voted for that. Um, so you know, we have to say, what is it that actually can be achieved that will get a majority in Parliament? I promise, I'm just really worried that if you don't shift on some of this stuff, we're just going to get stuck. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We're going to come on now to the Irish border and Andrew Murison. Prime Minister, good afternoon. Thank you, first of all, for your Herculean efforts and labours in uh, trying to ensure that the United Kingdom has removed decorously from the European Union in a way that gives most people in this country most of what they want. On the 25th of March, uh, you said in the Commons that we should not leave at that juncture uh, because you were concerned about the lack of preparations in Northern Ireland and that that might cause uh, a great deal of embarrassment. Uh, can you please say uh, what has been done in the weeks uh, that have been available to us to ensure that what needed to be prepared for uh, have indeed been offset and what in your view uh, still remains to be done? The, uh, as we have been able obviously and have published our proposals for the uh, position in relation to tariffs if there were a no deal situation across the border between Northern Ireland and the, and the Republic of Ireland, 
Um, the, but those could only be temporary and would need to have further obviously negotiation with the European Commission and with the Irish government for a long-term sustainable solution there. The issue um, that I had uh, expressly, and this was identified in the House at the time of uh, debates around that time in relation to Northern Ireland, was the whole question of the government's arrangements for Northern Ireland in a no-deal situation in the absence of the executive. Um, the, and, and the concern there was that there would be decisions that would need to be made that would, re, would not be able to be made simply by Northern Ireland civil servants and alternative governance arrangements would need to be put in place. Now that we now have an extension, of course, we now also have a situation where, as was uh, the Taoiseach and I last Friday called on <coughs> the parties to come together for talks to re-establish the devolved administration, and the uh, Secretary of State for Northern Ireland and the Tornishta uh, then set a date for talks for those, uh, with those parties to um, come together again. And I would hope that what we would be able to see would be um, the reinstatement of the executive and the uh, ability of the Assembly to operate in Northern Ireland such that those government's arrangements were then in place in Northern Ireland. So, so it's simply a question of there being lack of an executive in Northern Ireland that was causing you to express your concerns about the state of Northern Ireland in, 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 in the event that we had no deal. The, the, the concern that I had was about ensuring that it, at that point in time, if we had gone to no deal, that I think there were other implications for the union around no, that, but that at that point in time, that what the governance arrangements would be for Northern Ireland. So in the event that the talks are successful, those concerns would fall away. In the event that the talks were not successful, uh, we would be back in the same position, would we not? And that is that we would be unable to leave without a deal, um, except by um, direct rule. Would that be correct? Yes, or, uh, certainly. Um, obviously, direct rule can come in different, uh, the, maybe in different gradations, but ensuring that there was some form of governance which would uh, encompass some element, of, uh, certainly, of direct rule that enabled the decisions that were necessary to be taken. Did it inevitably mean ministerial decisions being taken here in Westminster rather than in Belfast? Yes, I mean, but as you know, that's why I hope that we will be able to see the talks actually resolving this issue and us seeing the devolved administration in Northern Ireland being reinstated. In February, Michel Barnier said that uh, a UK decision to leave the single market and leave the customs union would make border checks unavoidable. Uh, given the enduring common travel area arrangements plus regulatory and tariff alignment um, that exist, that would exist this between the two jurisdictions from day one um, in the event that we left without a deal, uh, can you say what do you think Mr Barnier would be checking for at the Irish border? Well, what um, the, what the U uh, European Union have consistently said is that their uh, rules in relation to border checks would need to be operated fully at the Northern Irish border <coughs> with, uh, with Ireland in the event of no deal. Um, and that would be the same as though the checks that they would put in place, uh, same as checks that they would put in place elsewhere. But the point is that uh, around about 1% of goods entering the Republic of Ireland from outside the European Union is subject to checks. That includes uh, from relatively high-risk countries, and an even smaller proportion of that are subject to physical checks. So it would be bizarre, would it not, that in the event that we left without a deal, the European Union would be insisting on a rate of checking goods entering the Republic of Ireland uh, beyond 1%. Would that, would that be your understanding too? Well, I think perhaps it might be helpful if I, I um, say what the Commission themselves said in their press notice on the 25th of March, which was, in a no-deal scenario, the UK will become a third country without any transitionary arrangements. The EU will be required to immediately apply its rules and tariffs at its borders with the UK. This includes checks and controls for customs, sanitary and phytosanitary standards and verification of compliance with EU norms. Similarly, UK citizens will no longer be citizens of the European Union. They will be subject to additional checks when crossing borders into the European Union. Um, despite the considerable preparations of the Member States, customs authorities, these controls could cause significant delays at the, at the border. So I think the European Union themselves were clear that there would be obviously checks taking place which currently do not take place at that, uh, at that border. Do you share my frustration, the frustration of many, that the Northern Ireland border uh, is being uh, used as an excuse uh, for um, our 
interlocutors to be difficult in relation to the Brexit process, since it seems uh, to many of us that it would be inconceivable that in the event of a no-deal Brexit, were it to happen, I sincerely hope it doesn't uh, happen, uh, that checks of any uh, magnitude uh, would be insisted based upon a risk-based process at the Irish border, and that therefore the Irish border is being used inappropriately uh, by many of those that you have to deal with in Brussels uh, to achieve its wider aims. Well, I, I won't comment on the approach that is taken by others in relation to the Northern Ireland border. What I would say is this, that I think it's incumbent on us as a UK government to recognise the importance of this issue. Uh, and the, the, the way I look at it is, is this. There is, at the heart of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, there is an essential compromise. And it is that people who are um, of Irish uh, heritage citizenship can live in Northern Ireland, they may have dual British citizenship, they can be part of living in the United Kingdom, but to all intents and purposes are able to operate across the island of Ireland um, in their day-to-day -day activities and in their business activities without, these, without checks taking place. And I think it is that um, that we must recognise uh, that lies essentially at the heart of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement that, that um, is uh, an important, uh, it's important for us to consider that when we're looking at these issues. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to come on now to the economy and trade, starting with Nicky Morgan. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Prime Minister. I, um, I sense and share your frustration that the withdrawal agreement remains unapproved by uh, Parliament. Um, are you concerned that one of the consequences of it not having been approved is the uncertainty created and that's now costing the economy hundreds of millions of pounds a week? Well, obviously uncertainty has an impact on business. Um, I think the reaction of business to the fact that an extension has been granted has been positive um, because they were concerned about the uh, uh, impact, uh, immediate impact of a no deal. Um, but of course, as soon as we can ratify this deal, business will be in a better position because they will know, uh, have some, have certainty about the uh, about the future. And I think it is clear that there are opportunities there for business, which would be, um, I'm going to say, unleashed, but will become available once uh, they have that certainty. I agree. And the latest data on UK business investment shows that it's fallen for six consecutive quarters now and been stagnant overall since 2016. So do you agree with the assessment of the Chancellor who told uh, the Treasury Select Committee last week that the principal reason is uncertainty created by the continuing process of working out how we will exit the European Union? As I say, uncertainty, uncertainty of any sort has an impact on, uh, on business. They have the current uncertainty in relation to, uh, to Brexit. Um, they welcomed the deal when we negotiated the deal. Um, they welcomed the fact that we had the transition or implementation period in place, which gave them that greater certainty for the future. I think there were real opportunities. I, I think, first of all, our economy has remained resilient against a background in which many had predicted and some had thought that it would uh, have a quite a different uh, um, outcomes. Uh, so. The way I would put it is, given the resilience and strength of our economy against this background of uncertainty, just think how much better that could be if we end that uncertainty, ratify the deal, leave the European Union with the deal in an orderly way. So I suppose what I'm asking really is, um, you know, is it your position that you would, if possible, like to uh, get the withdrawal agreement through and, and resolve that uncertainty as soon as possible, i.e. not to wait until the 31st of October, but to do it much sooner than that? Absolutely, definitely. I mean, that's why the element of... Um, fungibility or terminability, whichever term you wish to use, of the date was very important to me, i.e. that as soon as we've ratified the withdrawal agreement, the agreement is that as soon as we've ratified the withdrawal agreement, then we leave at the end of that the month in which that deal is ratified. Do you have a, a date in, in mind uh, that you're uh, able to share with the committee, you're targeting for potentially having another, another go? I'm, I'm tempted to say after the challenge I received earlier in relation to dates I've given in the past, and given uh, the uh, approach that the House has taken so far, I'm reluctant to put an actual date on it, except to say that I want to do this as soon as possible. Um, I've had several attempts to ensure that we could uh, do it and do it before the European parliamentary elections. Um, uh, we've got that longer extension available, but I want to ensure that we do it um, before that, um, and well before that 
extension date deadline comes into play. So one of the other areas of uncertainty that is created, of course, is what the impact of uh, Brexit or not having Brexit is on the comprehensive spending review, which I think we can all agree is a very important moment for uh, any uh, government. Now, the Chancellor again said to the committee, Treasury Committee last week that the spending review can't be undertaken until there is a Brexit deal. So are you concerned about the implication <coughs> of that for the ability of spending departments to plan ahead? Well, obviously, we have to look very carefully at uh, the spending departments. I think the Chancellor shares my hope uh, that we will be able to get this deal through within a timetable that enables them a preparation for a spending review and departments to be able to address that and the tra us as a government to be able to address that um, fully and properly in a, in a reasonable timetable. Uh, I think it is... Uh, it is uh, and, and so that, that is another element. If, if it were the case that we were still in a position, obviously, where we had not uh, agreed the deal, uh, then it would be necessary for us to take a, a decision in relation to the spending review and future spending determinations for departments, obviously. Uh, and do you have a sense of what that position would be? Would it have to be just a settlement for, for, for one year only? Or would there be certain... Obviously, I think the NHS uh, spending settlement was announced well, quite a long time ahead of the, the, the rest of the CSR. Uh, do you have a fallback position, if you like, for the comprehensive spending review? Uh, look, this is, that is a matter to be determined, depending on the circumstances in which we were to find ourselves. But our, we're working to get a deal through such that we can have a spending review in that uh, normal way. Uh, and just finally, one of the other things that the Treasury Select Committee uh, asked for and was, was given by the government was a detailed economic analysis of various uh, withdrawal uh, uh, type scenarios, uh, including, I think we it didn't quite model the government's actual the withdrawal agreement agreed with the, uh, the EU. Um, if there were to be success in the cross-party talks uh, and uh, there were to be some changes, and Yvette Cooper has probed on what, where there might be an area for, for, for some uh, change or agreement, would the government uh, prepare an updated economic analysis so that Parliament had all that information before MPs were asked to make a decision on uh, a revised withdrawal agreement? Um, as we haven't yet uh, determined whether or not there is a, a landing zone that is going to uh, uh, be possible, and, and if there were not, of course, we would go to the votes uh, from the uh, House of Commons and, and uh, the, would need to await the outcome of those votes. I mean, we would want to make, we want to ensure that the House of Commons is well informed on any decision that it is taking in relation to this matter. Thank you. So, could you just clarify, Prime Minister, does that mean that you would publish a revised economic impact assessment if there well, were Well, I, I, I recognise I didn't directly answer that question because I think we would need to look at what, anal what information. Prime Minister. Yes, I know. We would need to look at what information it was. Um, for, for Parliament to be informed, we would need to look at what information it was uh, Parliament should have in, in advance of, of uh, that. I mean, the, the analysis that was given previously um, did of course uh, from recollect I'm talking from recollection here but it did already analyze a number of potential uh, a number of potential outcomes um, and you know, obviously one would need to look at, at the uh, that in the light of any decisions that have been taken so would sorry just to, to follow up on the chair's question there for, so would uh, you uh, your office uh, the government be open for a discussion should there be a landing zone uh, identified and there be a proposal to put back to parliament um, is the government open to a discussion uh, between government and parliament as to the update analysis that's needed so that as you say MPs have all the information that they we possibly can have to make decisions on behalf of our constituents I think we would well I we will want to make sure that Parliament does have as much informa you know, the information that enables it to be well informed when it takes these uh, when it takes these decisions. Um, obviously, the but by definition, the economic any economic analysis can only go so far because it's about the future relationship. That's a matter for negotiation. So it's not an economic analysis that says this is definitely where you're going to end up and this is definitely going to be the answer, because the negotiation result won't be known at that point. I appreciate it, but, but absolutely. But, but of course, um, there is an impact. Different scenarios will have different impacts on the economy according to the likelihood of uh, future successful uh, and how open the trade deals are or the trade relationship is between the UK and the EU, which I think is what the Treasury were trying to get to in their first analysis. Yes, and indeed, as I say, they, they, they did provide analysis on, on a variety of scenarios at that point. <coughs> Thank you. We're going to come on to jobs and skills and Rachel Reeves.
Thank you very much, Chair. Um, thank you, Prime Minister. You said in your answer to Nicky Morgan that you want to bring forward the withdrawal agreement and get it passed as soon as possible, but certainly well before the 31st of October deadline. But to do that, you need to do something different from what you've done the last three times you've brought forward that withdrawal agreement. The Chief Whip apparently told Cabinet yesterday that it's time to get real on Brexit and the solution is either a customs union or a second referendum. Would you agree with him on that, Prime Minister? Well, first of all, I don't, don't uh, comment on uh, Cabinet discussions or uh, supposed reports of Cabinet discussions. Um, but I refer to the answers I've been giving earlier. Um, it is the case that we sit down. This is, I, I think it's important not simply to see this in case of a discussion about can you go for this model or can you go for that model. It's actually about sitting down and saying what is it that we're trying to achieve, what are the objectives we're trying to achieve, what are the various means in which we can do that, and, how, and is there an agreement around the objectives and the means to achieve those objectives. They're trying to explore today is what are the parameters for some sort of compromise uh, and what will different sides be willing to give. The Foreign Secretary warned yesterday against agreeing a deal that includes a customs union. That was on the record. Do you agree with him, Prime Minister? I have been very clear. Uh, uh, look, I come back to what I've said earlier, what I was saying earlier. Because the trouble is that these phrases of a customs union are sometimes used. No, but, but not mine. What, what is your definition then of a customs union? This is what the Foreign Secretary said. Presumably you know the, the definition of no, it is, Prime Minister. The, the point is that we have been sit, we are sitting down with the, op, the uh, official opposition. We are discussing with the official opposition the elements of these issues, where we agree on the elements of these issues, and where we do not agree on the elements of those issues. And that's why I have always, it, it's not the first time I think I've actually said this before this liaison on committee or said this in the House of Commons, that I think it is important in the detail that we do that we do look at the detail because it's by looking at the detail that we will be able to identify whether there is a landing zone on which we can both agree. Now, I want, I want a situation where we have a good, close and deep and close partnership with the European Union uh, and we ensure that we can have an independent trade policy. Well, on a specific issue of policy detail, the UK benefits from the brightest and best students from across the EU coming to our great universities and young people from the UK benefit from being able to go to universities across the EU. Do you think higher fees for students from the EU countries wishing to study here will mean more or less students coming to study here and would that be good or bad for our economy, Prime Minister? Well, first of all, Obviously, uh, we welcome overseas students to the UK. There's no limit on the number of overseas students who can come to the United Kingdom. Um, we want to ensure that UK and European countries can continue to give students to the, the chance to benefit from each other's world-leading universities after we leave. Um, we've been clear that EU <coughs> students starting courses in England in the next academic year will continue to be eligible uh, for the same tuition fees as UK students, and no further decisions have been made, and we'll make those decisions and provide sufficient notice in due course. So, to go back to my questions, do you think that higher fees for EU students wishing to study in this country, will higher fees mean more or less students coming to this country, and would that be good or bad for the economy, Prime Minister? First of all, I would say that there are overseas students that obviously pay higher fees than EU students do at the moment, and we have seen increases in many of those from a number of those countries of students coming to the UK, so the fee level has not been something that has put those students off. What I hope uh, attracts the students to come to the United Kingdom is actually the quality of the education they receive in our universities. And I would hope that that would continue whatever the arrangements for the fees that we put in place in future. You've spoken previously about the burning injustices in society. If UK students are priced out of studying um, abroad at universities in other EU countries and only rich students can afford to do that, do you think that would help to tackle or that would exacerbate some of those injustices you've spoken about so passionately, Prime Minister? Well, I think that the I, I have spoken about a number of burning injustices. I want every young person to have the opportunity to go as far as their talents and their hard work will take them, whatever their background. Um, I would also argue, actually, that while there are students from the UK who choose to go and study at oh, universities elsewhere, we're very fortunate in the United Kingdom in having a number of, for example, a number of our universities who are actually in the top 20 universities in the world. Um, I think certainly, I think it may be the top 20. I'm, Pretty sense for the top ten, 
we're the only EU country that does have uh, universities in that uh, category. So I think we have, we have excellent universities here in the UK. Quite relaxed about there being higher fees for EU students coming to study here and British students going to study overseas. Is that right, Prime Minister? What I've said is that I think, I think what is important is the quality of education, the determination of whether or not European universities uh, at, give higher fees to UK students is, of course, not a matter that is uh, a determination for the United Kingdom. We will, in due course, make clear what our position is in relation to EU students coming here to the, uh, to the UK for years beyond those starting in the next academic year. Of course, the quality matters, but also access to the quality. And I don't want to see a situation where only children from better off families, either from the EU or from this country, are able to access the university of their, their choice, Prime Minister. The ability to access uh, uh, universities and the ability to exchange with other European countries is something that we have been very clear we want to see continuing through the Erasmus programme. That's one of the elements of the political declaration that we have negotiated. We want those opportunities to, uh, to be available. Very finally, on a slightly different theme, um, there have been 120 governors of the Bank of England and all of them have been men. Later this year, the government will appoint the 121st governor of the Bank of England. People are increasingly suggesting that that person should be a woman. Would you, Prime Minister, encourage women to apply for this job and would you look favourably on a woman applicant to be our next governor of the Bank of England? Well, as you, you might have noticed, I do like it when women are in senior positions. I think that uh, <laughs> women should be encouraged to apply for senior positions. Of course, the decision will be... Uh, it's be important to take the decision as to who is the right person to be the Governor of the Bank of England. But I would encourage uh, applications from female, uh, female applicants. Thank you. We're going to come on now to trade policy and Angus Brendan McNeill. Thank you, Chair. Um, Prime Minister, I think the last time I had the privilege and the pleasure of uh, discussing with you at the Liaison Committee was on the 18th of July when I compared you to Gloria Gaynor and your tremendous uh, powers of survival. Uh, and on that day, um, Boris Johnson was making his resignation speech at the same time as you were at the committee here. You, you've, out, you've outwitted them all, and yet you, you, you continue. Uh, Boris has been uh, uh, fully outmanoeuvred. He is nowhere. Um, and your own ki can kicking down the road has continued, and you're changing the nuance has continued. And I noticed today that, I mean, you've told us before, there were three options for Brexit. There was deal, there was no deal, there was revoke. But now you're tagging on people's vote. How much should we read into your change on people's vote? Uh, nothing whatsoever. I mean, that is, that is uh, the, the uh, options have <coughs> been there. What we see from... Sorry? They weren't the options you were giving before. It was revoke, it was deal, no deal and revoke. Now it's deal, no deal, revoke and people's vote. My position on a people's vote has not changed, if that's what you're so trying to suggest. Because I, we, 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 what I put, well, Parliament has, Parliament has raised the issue of a people's vote. There are those in Parliament who are supporting a people's vote. There are those in Parliament who have perhaps previously supported honouring the referendum who are now supporting a people's vote. Um, you know, it, it is a, a second referendum. That's uh, what, uh, what it is. My view remains the same, that we should deliver on the first referendum. Um, and uh, I think that is, uh, I think that's important. And you said that I was kicking the can down the road. Actually, no, I've, I've tried, I've tried not to kick the can down the road. I, I've been voting in order to ensure that the can is not kicked any further, and that we actually leave. And on March the 18th of July, we're in surprise that you're still Prime Minister then, and you've managed to kick the can down the road further. So well done. Um, to move on a little bit, um, the uh, the expectation was the UK was going to leave on the 29th of March and that the EU trade deals would be rolled over, uh, in fact, a second after midnight, I think. Now, as far as it is at the moment, only trade deals covering 5.5% of UK trade out of a total of 14.4% of UK trade that, that we have taken place under EU trade agreement partners. Uh, what barriers will British exporters face trading on WTO terms? And we'll also take the opportunity to make sure that people, particularly in your own party, who get up at Prime Minister's questions and suggest that trading under WTO is a good idea, is in fact quite the reverse. Well, first of all, we obviously do trade with some uh, uh, countries around the world on WTO terms. Um, in, relation to the, in, in relation to the agreements, we've signed agreements with Switzerland, Chile, Faroe Islands, Eastern and Southern African Economic Partnership, agreement states, Israel and the Palestinian Authority. We sign mutual recognition agreements with the US, Australia and New Zealand, and we expect others to follow soon. A number of other agreements are at an advanced stage. 
Um, I think that uh, obviously we're still working on enabling people to have the certainty in relation to those trade deals. The Faroese have done quite well, a small, small agreement, but it's 16 to 1 in their favour. They export 16 times more than they import from the UK, so I can see why they were very keen to have the trade agreement uh, continuing and wisely so. Well done, those in Torsavan, again, outwitting uh, others. Um, Prime Minister, um, the whole process that you've gone around Brexit, you came to Parliament at a later stage. You didn't take Parliament with you, and then you found that from various sides, uh, people rejected your, your withdrawal agreement, the deal that you'd that you'd struck with the European Union, and you have had difficulty with that since then. But moving forward to future trade agreements, do you think there's anything to be learned from the process that went so badly wrong for you uh, in the Brexit process? Well, the, uh, obviously there are certain arrangements that are in place in relation to Parliament's role in trade agreements generally. Um, in relation to the future relationship with the European Union, as I indicated earlier, uh, and uh, I, as I said in the 29th of March, debate that we had on the uh, withdrawal agreement, that we accepted the premise of the um, Gareth Snell, Lisa Nandy amendment in relation to the role of Parliament in the future on negotiating objectives for that future phase. Any future trade agreements, should Parliament, you think, have a meaningful vote at the outset to help even guide negotiators during trade agreement uh, negotiations? Well, I think if, uh, uh, if you look at the Nandy Smell Snell amendment that we said that we would accept that makes it clear the role of Parliament in the uh, negotiating objectives. For all trade agreements in future, you would, no, there would be a meaningful vote in Parliament. No, for this, sorry, thank you. Um, it said that MPs would be empowered to set the negotiating mandate for phase two. There'd be a regular report from the PM on the negotiations and the extent to which those reflected the negotiating mandate, the outcome reflected the negotiating mandate. And MPs must approve signing any agreement on the future relationship with the European Union. Well, that is about. I'm talking about any and all other future trade agreements. This is, is about. Anything that can be learned from that. This is about the future relationship that we have with the European Union. Um, as you will be aware, as you will be aware, there are already uh, 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 arrangements in place in relation to the role that Parliament takes in uh, and discussions in relation to trade agreements more generally. And the 27% hit on questions is still continuing. Prime Minister, there's a climate emergency being uh, uh, talked about and, uh, and declared by various people. Uh, what do you feel about that? Well. Uh, I think that climate change is one of the, as I said in the House of Commons in PMQs, I think it's one of the biggest challenges that the, we face across the, across the world. I mean, the, the term emergency has been used. I think the, the difficulty I have with that is the term emergency suggests this is something that has just suddenly arisen. Um, and it's not the case, and that you, know, you just have to look at what the government's excellent record in climate change. Uh, we have been working on this, uh, and we continue to work on it. There is more for us to do. We recognise that. But if you look at the fact that, uh, as I say, I think we, as uh, the, uh, since 2010, we have had decarbonised more than any other uh, G20 country. We have been at the leading edge of ensuring that we're working on this. Still, well over double the, the targets for. Um carbon in uh, electricity production and a branch of your government, Ofgem, is sitting on the possibility of connecting to the, some of the best wind resources in Europe uh, for spurious reasons. Would, would you undertake to look under, to look into uh, the possibility of interconnectors being used properly to where there's wind? Well, the, the, I'm very pleased to say that obviously as in terms of uh, wind turbines and the provision of uh, renewable energy from wind, once again we have an excellent record. I was able to be, I know uh, there are uh, wind farms which uh, uh, in relation to uh, off the Scottish coast, I was in Grimsby uh, a number of weeks ago um, with a company there that is one of the leading providers of the equipment for wind farms. I think there's a great deal that we can be doing in relation final, to that. Final brief question. Uh, why can't you accept Scotland having the same autonomy in the UK as the UK has regards the EU, particularly with referendums? The EU does not stop you holding referendums or even attempts to interfere. Why would you interfere with Scotland doing the same? Scotland had a referendum on its independence, on its role and we'd in the UK. People's vote. We've, we've, no, we've had a referendum, and I've been very clear, yeah, as I've said. Is that what you're saying? We've had a referendum in the United Kingdom on membership of the European Union. My view is that we should abide by the result of that referendum and deliver on it. 
Scotland had a referendum in 2014, and my view is that Scotland, Scotland should continue to abide by the result of that referendum, which was that it should be part of the United Kingdom. Thank you. Thank you. We come now to David T. C. Davis. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Prime Minister, is Wales prepared for a no deal Brexit? We have been in, in the no deal preparations that uh, have been taking place and continue to take place. We have been involving the devolved administrations, including obviously the uh, uh, um, uh, government in Wales and the uh, assembly. Uh, the Assembly, but the uh, government in Wales, representatives have been able to be sit, sit round the table with UK uh, ministers and others in terms of their preparations. The preparations that are necessary have all been made. Well, I'm, I'm confident from everything that we've seen in relation to the Welsh Government, but I would be, if uh, the intent of the question is, is that you are aware of areas where you're concerned about that, then obviously we would wish to hear those. One of the concerns raised is amongst uh, the land farmers who are heavily dependent on exports to the EU, especially France. Um, are you confident that if we left with no deal, they would not suffer financially? And if they did, would special support be put in place for them? One of the uh, aspects that we have been considering as a government is looking at those areas which could be particularly affected in a no deal situation and uh, the extent to which it would be appropriate for government to um, act in those circumstances. Um, that is a debate that continues. Would you agree that uh, as we members of parliament none of us are actually going to get exactly what we want in terms of Brexit? Is that a fair um, suggestion? I think, I think that is a fair comment. And, and I, I have to agree with you. And, that being the case, if you don't get what you want, which is the withdrawal agreement passed, which I personally, as a loyal backbencher, have always supported, but if we are unsuccessful in uh, persuading our colleagues to support this, would your preference be for a no-deal Brexit or to remain in the European <coughs> Union? My view is we should leave the European <coughs> Union because that's what the British get people... get what we want. We, so we may have we, to choose between things we don't want, and the choice may be... And I think that we should leave the European Union, yes. and my job is to try to make sure we leave the European Union with as much as we want as possible. As we've just agreed, we're not necessarily going to get what we want. You and I would both like the withdrawal agreement to pass, but if we don't get that, would you be happy to support a no-deal Brexit? I, as I've just said, I believe that the important thing for us <coughs> is to deliver on the result of the referendum, and that means leaving the European Union. But I hope that we can both... Around can I? Because, because I think this is important, that, that because I, I, I detect a change in government <coughs> policy here. Am I, can I conclude from what you're saying to me that you would not support a no-deal Brexit? No. Under any circumstances. The, 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 the position of the government is that the, the best option for the United Kingdom is to leave with a deal. That is what I'm... I believe that's what I'm working for, that's what the government has been working for. I believe that we should leave the European Union. I believe it's important to deliver on the result of the referendum. I believe we're also in a set of circumstances where Parliament has made clear that in the circumstances where it, it looked as if no deal was happening, Parliament would act again to try and ensure that there wasn't a, that there wasn't a no deal situation. Um, so I, I would have hoped that we could all just agree with, that we recognise, as, as you do, that the withdrawal agreement doesn't give everybody uh, what, they, uh, what they want, um, but that actually leaving with it is the best option for the UK. You've been undermined by members of your own cabinet who have suggested semi-publicly that we couldn't leave without a deal. The, well, Parliament has said that they don't want us to leave without a deal. I mean, that is, that, is the, that is the reality. <laughs> members of your cabinet, do you think they've undermined you? I think what is important is that we work to deliver government policy, which is that we leave, that the preference is to leave with a deal, and we work to leave with a deal. It was government policy to leave by the 31st of March. Um, the failure to leave... 29, sorry. The, the failure to leave by that date is a failure, isn't it? It is a failure. I wanted to leave on the 29th of March. I voted to leave on the 29th of March. Others voted to leave on the 29th of March. Sadly, not failure. sufficient it numbers is, in the House voted to leave on the 29th failure, of March. It? it is a failure. It is a failure. 
Well, people wanted us to leave on the 29th of March. And we wanted to leave. We weren't able to achieve that. We have failed. We, we, we weren't able to achieve that. What we must not fail in is leaving the European Union. We must ensure that we deliver on leaving the European Union. But as, as we've said and as you've indicated, you agree with, that it's better to do that with a deal. Prime Minister, you've agreed with David T.C. Davis that none of us are going to get what we want. But more importantly, um, isn't it the case that that applies to the British people as well? And you've always talked about making sure you want to implement the will of the people. Um, isn't it right now that we, we know what version of Brexit that we may get when you reach that landing zone, that you actually check it is what the people want or whether they'd rather stick with the deal that they have? Well. I, I'm afraid I haven't changed my view on this, uh, on this issue from the discussions we've had both uh, privately and publicly on it. I continue to believe that having Parliament having overwhelmingly given the decision to the British people and said, do you want to stay in or uh, leave the European Union? The British people having, in the biggest exercise in democracy in our history, said we want to leave the European Union. Government at the time having said it would abide by the result of that referendum. I believe it's important that we do that. And uh, I don't believe it's right to effectively say to people, think again. Uh, I think, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's all, you know, sometimes people say, oh, well, people didn't know what the uh, deal was going to be. They didn't know what this was going to be like. Actually, I trust the British people rather more. I think British people had um, an instinct as to what it was that they wanted to see. And they voted... That, that very many of them are deeply unhappy with the deal. Indeed, the, one of the reasons it won't pass Parliament is even the loudest voices for Brexit won't vote for the deal. So how can you be sure this is the will of the people unless you go back and ask them whether this particular deal is the will of the people. I think for most uh, members of the public, actually, they just want us to get on and do it. They, want us, way, they want us to leave the European Union. There's a sense that they ask government to do that, and they want government to be able to, uh, to deliver on that. Mm. Yeah. I think that's, that's very okay, debatable. Um, a, the next question is, would you rather accept a compromise on a customs union with the leader of the opposition, or get your deal through subject to a confirmatory vote. That's what it looks like it might come down to. Because your deal would get through if you made it subject to a confirmatory vote. I think there are lots of, uh, that, that there, there's an assumption that is underlying your question, which uh, I don't accept. We are sitting down with the opposition to uh, see whether there is an agreement that we can come together. I can't say whether we've having <coughs> constructive talks we are having talks that are looking in detail at these issues. Um, uh, obviously, in terms of getting not just uh, uh, you know, the, the, the deal, but the legislation through the House of Commons, I would hope that we would be able to find an agreement that would enable us to have that stable majority, because I genuinely still believe that's the uh, best way for this, uh, for this country. But there are a number of issues that we're debating with the, uh, with the opposition. Um, I think you were absolutely right to seek an extension, but of course what hasn't been extended is the end of the transition phase, which will still run out on the 31st of December next year. Do you think that that will leave you enough time to negotiate all the future arrangements and, and the deal? Well, obviously the time has been uh, reduced in, in relation to that. Um, Although it was always the case, of course, that with the, a new commission coming into place, there was going to be a period of time when the commission was not going to be um, able to be as fully engaged as, as otherwise in this, uh, in this issue. I think it's important. It, it is still possible to achieve it by the uh, end of December 2020. Right. So you won't be seeking an extension of the transition phase as well? The, it is, as I say, it is possible to achieve it by the end of December 2020. The withdrawal agreement has within it the possibility of an extension of that implementation period. Can you think of any other major international trade deals that would be negotiated in such a short space of time? Well, the I forget what the average the average figure for negotiating trade deals is actually uh, a, a lot shorter than many people think it is. We're operating. We've already got the basis for the future uh, deal in terms of the political declaration. So a considerable amount of work has already been done in relation to uh, in relation to this.
Okay, and, and finally, I think one thing that appalls people is how much of the domestic agenda has just been sidelined because of Brexit. And one particular example of that is the social care green paper. I mean, we have an absolute crisis in social care and a need to, to find a long-term sustainable solution. Could you, Prime Minister, set out, because I've, I've asked repeatedly about this in the, in the Commons, when is the social care green paper going to be published so at least we can get on and start debating it? First of all, I um, reject the concept that we have simply set to one side or ignored up the domestic agenda. There are many aspects of uh, what we've been doing in the domestic agenda which perhaps haven't uh, hit the headlines in the way that they might have done in another way in, in different circumstances, but which we have been getting on and delivering for people across, this, uh, across the country. In relation to social care, of course, there are a number of commitments that have already been made in relation to funding, extra funding that has gone into local authorities for social care. Uh, part of, obviously, the work that will be done, as I indicated in the House of Commons today, in, in uh, the Chamber today in PMQs, it, uh, in, is about the interaction between the health service and uh, social care. And the long-term plan in the health, National Health Service is an important element of, of that. And obviously that is now um, being, put into, uh, being put into place. Really being hampered by the failure to publish the Social Care Green Paper, if I may say, Prime Minister. I understand why, given that the Social Care Green Paper has been written, why it can't now be published. I mean, today we had a presentation of a bill on wild animals in circuses. Um, I would say that, with respect, what the public really want to see is the publication and debate of social care, which has a profound impact on people across this country. Yeah. I recognise the impact that social care has on people across this country. I think what people want to know is that this is a government that has been uh, dealing with these issues, that we have been, as, we, as I said, uh, four billion, around four billion pounds is uh, more uh, money is available this year to local councils in relation to adult social care. Uh, I think it is important that we look at these other issues. It's not just, there is a question about the long-term sustainability of social care. There's also, I've always said this is a short-term, medium-term and long-term issue. And the medium term is also about the way in which we interact health service and social care and ensuring that issues like delayed discharges from hospitals are being reduced, such that, which is better, not just for the hospitals, it's better for the individuals concerned. So these are issues that we are continuing to look With at. With you, Prime Minister. We will bring forward a green paper on social care um, in, in at the earliest opportunity. But, but Prime Minister, have, with respect to answer my question, what I'd like to know is when. We know it's been written. We know it's ready to go. Will you, will you publish it? No, I, I'm sorry. That, that you're making an assumption that there is a completed green paper on social care. Um, and, uh, no, as I say, we will, bring, uh, we will bring a green paper on social care forward. Uh, we will do so as soon as possible. There are a number of aspects of social care that we are looking at and that we will be continuing to look at. Um, it's, there's a long-term sustainability issue. There is also the medium-term issues about how we ensure best practice is going to be uh, is, is introduced. Best practice as it is today, but also looking at what we think best practice should be in the future. We were promised from the dispatch box that it would be published before Christmas. I, I'm afraid I don't think that's good enough. But I'm going to move on now to um, Dr Julian Lewis and Huawei. So now it's the time for the easy stuff, Prime Minister. Which is the more important, our intelligence relationship with the United States or our commercial relationship with communist China? We have, as you know, a very, a very particular intelligence relationship with the United States and we continue to work with the United States in that deep and special way that we always have done. That relationship is the deepest uh, and uh, uh, relationship across both security and defence issues, and we continue that relationship and maintain that relationship. Okay, I'll draw the appropriate inference from that. Do you agree that China is an oppressive one-party state and are you aware of Article 14 of China's national intelligence law passed in June 2017, which empowers the agencies of the Chinese state to, and I quote, request of relevant organs, organizations, and civilians to provide necessary support, assistance, and cooperation to those agencies? Yes, I am aware of that, uh, and I'm also aware to uh, complete the first question that you asked me, that there are obviously commercial opportunities in relation to China. 
we have uh, developed that uh, uh, relationship with China. I took a trip of business people, a, a trade trip to China, um, which was successful in opening opportunities for British companies in exporting, and, and, and indeed British farmers in exporting to, uh, to China. And it's important as we look at the future of this country that we recognise the needs both for our security and our prosperity. Okay. Last December, our own Foreign Office issued a press release entitled UK and Allies Reveal Global Scale of Chinese Cyber Campaign. It blamed a group called APT10, operating under the Chinese Ministry of State Security, for mounting what our Foreign Secretary described as, and I quote, one of the most significant and widespread cyber intrusions against the UK and allies to date, targeting trade secrets and eco economies around the world. So do you accept that the Chinese <coughs> regime does indeed engage in systematic cyber espionage against us and our allies? There are uh, many uh, who are, uh, we are aware of the necessity of ensuring our cybersecurity because of the threats that there are to cybersecurity. We are, as a country, we have been willing to call out those who we have seen um, uh, uh, attacking us in this, uh, in this way. There are a number of uh, players out there, state and non-state players, who do this. Yes, uh, and this we are, and we are specific. And we already willing to call out those who mm -hmm. do it. And on this occasion, last December, we called out China, didn't we? We did. Right. Do you accept that the telecommunications firm Huawei is intimately linked with the Chinese Communist government and its deeply hostile intelligence agencies? Uh, if I may expand my answer to this, uh, to this question. Now, uh, you will be aware that Huawei is officially owned by its employees and is a private Chinese company. However, we have robust procedures in place to manage risks to national security today and are committed to mitigating future risks. I don't think you can describe me as somebody who has been lax in relation to national security. If you look at my record, I have been, uh, uh, the decisions I take are decisions that are taken in the interests of national security. But you're not contradicting me when I'm suggesting that Huawei is intimately linked with the Chinese Communist government and its deeply hostile intelligence agencies, are you? I said Huawei is officially owned by its employees and is yes. a private Chinese company. Um, we, we look, but the issue, the issue of cyber security yes. is I not an issue, that. is not an issue of one country. I, the, I, I, one, with respect, one company, China, my time one country, is very the issue of cyber security yeah. is one that we have put significant resource into. We have developed our National Cyber Security Center. That is an organization that, is, that I think is well respected across the world for the work that it does. Uh, we do want to ensure that as we look to the future development of telecoms networks and networks here in the United Kingdom, that we can ensure the uh, greater resilience of those networks, uh, that we improve cybersecurity, Prime Minister, um, why did your deputy, David Liddington, say in response to that question that I've just put to you that, quote, legally speaking, Huawei is a private firm and not a government-owned company? Isn't it really rather vacuous to talk in such terms in the context of a totalitarian communist state with laws of which you've said you're aware, compelling companies to cooperate with its intelligence agencies. I have indicated the position in relation to the uh, nature of Huawei, as, uh, as I said, as a private Chinese company. Um, the, uh, but that's meaningless, it, isn't it? In the context, you cannot have a company of that size purporting to be private in a totalitarian communist regime. You and I, Prime Minister, grew up in the Cold War. We know the nature of these regimes, and uh, we know that it is utterly unbelievable to suggest that a company structured like that in a communist society has any sort of independence from a government which has passed a law requiring such companies to cooperate with its intelligence agencies. Isn't that a, a pretty bulletproof chain of logic? 
what is, what is important is how we deal with these issues of cyber security. And as I indicated earlier, we are aware of the ability of both state and non-state actors uh, to gain access to telecoms infrastructure. Um, in relation to uh, Huawei uh, currently, we have the Huawei Cyber Security Evaluation Centre that assesses component and software destined for use in UK telecommunications to identify potential vulnerabilities. And the most recent oversight board uh, report uh, noted concerns of cybersecurity in Huawei products, but found no evidence of state interference. Uh, and that is, you know, this is an issue that we take extremely seriously. As I say, we're aware of the ability of both state and non-state actors to uh, deal in this, uh, in this issue. I have to stop. Can I just urge you to take the time to have a look at the June 2003 report of the Intelligence and Security <coughs> Committee on which I served at the time, not just the published version of the report, but the, the unredacted version of the report to which you obviously have access, and see once you've read that if you really believe that there's nothing to worry about espionage from Huawei. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming this afternoon, Prime Minister. Thank you.